Well, friends, what do you think? What do you think the Apostle Paul would make of our situation today? With the culture around us growing ever more overtly hostile to biblical Christianity, what would he make of all we've been thinking through? What would he make of the situation of the church? Would he be surprised? What would he say? Would you turn with me to Philippians 1, where we see Paul not comfortable, not lionized, not accepted by Roman culture, but in chains. And there, imprisoned for his faith, he writes to the Philippians and he tells them that his ultimate concern is not what happens to him, for he doesn't know his fate. His concern is what will happen to the gospel. And from that concern erupts a passionate apostolic plea. Philippians 1, verse 27. Here is what Paul would say to a church surrounded by a hostile culture and tempted to compromise. Philippians 1, 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Those are words that have echoed down the centuries, fulfilled in those times of martyrdom and persecution, when things at the time looked bleakest, but which we now know as the church's days of glory. Like the days of the reformers, Latimer and Ridley tied to a stake in Broad Street, Oxford in England, slowly burned to death for their steely insistence on the complete sufficiency of Christ as a Savior. Picture it. The situation looked so grim, so bleak. Here were the greatest preachers in England being snuffed out. It looked like the faith of the gospel was being smothered, choked as they choked. And yet, Latimer seemed to glimpse for a moment the angel's perspective when he turned through the flames and said to his friend, be of good cheer, Master Ridley, and play the man. For we shall this day by God's grace light such a candle in England as shall never be put out. Now, that answers Paul's plea, standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Can you imagine it in Broad Street, Oxford? How the angels must have cheered. For there, just as 
the Lord appeared in the burning bush to Moses. There, in the flames of martyrdom, was Christ-likeness, glory in the flames. And oh, friends, to see such bright steadfastness today. Oh, to see that. Today, we are heading into testing times. But let us not call them dark times. These days to come could be days of glory that will be remembered in the annals of church history when Christians, tempted to surrender, pressured, reviled, hounded, stood firm. They were of good cheer, and by their resilient faith, the annals of church history may say, they lit a candle that lighted centuries to come. But, friends, if these days to come are to be days of glory, we need to know, how can we have the strength to stand firm, to endure? Where did Latimer and Ridley get such bold resilience? It's one thing for us to admire their courage, but if it were asked of us, where does it come from? And if the Philippians were wondering that question, how they could stand firm without being frightened of anything, how do you do that? Paul had actually given them the answer already. In verse 20, he wrote, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Quite simply for Paul, Christ meant more to him than life. And that's what I want to press into with you now, to prepare us, to give us backbone for our faith. But first, let me put it the other way around. What is it that makes for cowardice? What makes someone prone to compromise God's Word? And to see the answer to that, I want to look with you at the men who are probably the archetypical cowards in the Bible. Do you know who they were? The Pharisees. That surprises some because the Pharisees, they appear supremely confident and impressive. People respected and feared them. But it is striking how timid the Pharisees actually appear in the Gospels. You look at them, commonly, despite all their bravado in public, they commonly act only by stealth, under the cover of darkness. So remember Nicodemus in John 3 comes to Jesus at night. When is it they seek to arrest Jesus? Under the cover of darkness, when all is quiet. Or when Jesus publicly confronts them and challenges them, they remain silent. Or they grumble, whisper, conspire. Theirs was a creeping, whispery, cowardly culture. Now, why? Why were the Pharisees so frightened? Well, in John 12, Jesus cut through to the very heart of what motivated the Pharisees and tells us why. 
this is why they were so timid. This is why those who should stand firm for Christ don't. This is why. You ready? John 12, verse 43, literally, they love the glory of men more than the glory of God. That's it. And with those words, John 12, 43, Jesus cuts like a scalpel through to their fundamental motivation. Their issue was what they loved. But what exactly did Jesus mean? Did he mean they loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God? Or did he mean they love the glory of men more than the glory that is due to and should be ascribed to, that belongs to God? I suggest he means both. They loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God because they were blind to the true nature of the glory that is God's. Jesus said in John 5, I do not receive glory from people, but the Pharisees, they clearly preferred the acclamation of others. That's what they lived for. Their lust for the approval of others made them forget to seek the approval of God. Friends, be warned. Indeed, their lust for the approval of others blinded them to God. With their eyes on others, hungry for popularity and praise, they would never dare confess Christ or go against the crowd. Instead, said Jesus, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. So they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the places of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi. And in one sense, you could ask, how could they choose the approval of mere creatures over the approval of the Lord of glory? And when I put it like that in black and white, of course, you see, the choice is irrational and idiotic. And yet, it's a choice we all fall into the whole time. They preferred the glory of man because God was not sufficiently glorious in their eyes. And therefore, they would abandon God for man every time. In 1677, Henry Skugel wrote a famous work, The Life of God in the Soul of Man. It was a work that some 50 years later convinced George Whitfield of his need to be born again. And Skugel said, true religion is more than a matter of orthodox opinions. It's more than a matter of moral behavior. It's more than a matter of great emotional experiences. It is, he said, a delightful and affectionate sense of the divine. A delightful, affected sense of the divine that makes the soul resign itself to him, desiring above all things him, and being ready to do or suffer anything for his sake. The Pharisees lacked that. 
that delightful, affectionate sense of the divine. Instead, the Pharisees had a delightful and affectionate sense of themselves. They didn't appear in their own eyes to be great sinners. And therefore, Christ did not appear to them to be a great savior. He was not glorious to them. So, not perceiving the extent of God's love and compassion, they turned to find love and acceptance elsewhere. Instead of looking up to the glory and grace of God, they looked down. They looked down at the text they sought to master. They looked down at others for approval. They looked down on others in competition. Impressed more by themselves and by others than by a God who didn't seem very relevant. Since he wasn't a great savior to them. Didn't seem to do much for them. They cared more for what others thought than what God thought. Blind to the gloriousness of God, of course they were more impressed with their own glory and sought more from others. Their spiritual short-sightedness imprisoned them in the hamster wheel of people-pleasing. Do you struggle with that? Here's the answer. In contrast to the Pharisees, God is the glory, the portion, the treasure, the reward of true faith. Romans 4.20, Abraham grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. David cries in Psalm 3, You, O Lord, are my shield about me, my glory. Where the Pharisees look for some other reward, the saints declare, the Lord is my portion. Which is why Paul could write in Galatians 1, am I now seeking the approval of man? Am I trying to please men? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Friends, those who don't perceive the glory of God, the beauty of His glory, they do not truly know Him, and so they will not live for Him. They'll live for other things. Augustine famously wrote in the City of God his great work that humanity divides over this issue into two cities. And these two cities, he explained, have been formed by two loves. The earthly city by a love of self, even to hatred of God. The heavenly city by love of God, even to contempt of self. The earthly glorifies in itself the latter, the heavenly in the Lord. The earthly seeks glory from men, but the greatest glory of the heavenly is God. The earthly lifts up its head in its own glory. The other says to God, you are my glory and the lifter up of my head. Heavenliness or worldliness? Faithfulness or cowardice? Friends, everything depends on where glory is found and enjoyed. 
Where do you find, where do you enjoy glory? Now, of course, loving the glory of men more than the glory of God is an itch we all know. We feel it inside us. We see it around us. So if you're feeling, yes, oh, the glory of men, the people pleasing, that is a problem for me. What can we do about it? How can we get out of the hamster wheel and find a happy resilience and courage? How can we do that? Because we want that. What hope is there? There is one. 1 Timothy 1.11, the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. The gospel is the means by which you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the gospel reveals it is the deepest revelation of, of the glory of God enabling us to see a wonderful, superior beauty in God, far above, far more satisfying than any human glory. And when your eyes are open to see the superior beauty and worth and satisfaction of God's glory, then you will love the glory of God more than the glory of men. And you will find yourself strong and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Friends, it is through pressing into the gospel that you will see the glory that surpasses the glory of men. It is pressing into no God that will make you want Him more than popularity and praise. And so transform you from the sort who will cave in as soon as people are against you to one who'll always stand for God because He's more glorious to you. That will give you the strength to stand firm and not be frightened. And because the Pharisees didn't do that, they didn't know God's glory. You see, the Pharisees, they completely misunderstood glory. They thought glory was a a fame and applause, a clapping, to be got from people. And oh, how they wanted that. But if that's what glory is a fame to be acquired from others, then, well, if that's what God's about, if God's just an eager, needy little being desiring, please clap me, please need me and appreciate me, well, God's a a burden, not a delight then. And if He's always needy of our attention, then we'll prefer the glory of men to him if he's just a burden. But Jesus repeatedly told his disciples, I do not seek my own glory. Rather, it is my Father who glorifies me. You see, the one who is the very glory of God does not seek or need the glory of men. Instead, he's glorified by his Father. And how? What is the hour of his glorification? His self-giving death that bears much fruit. It is in the riches of His grace that we see the riches of His glory. And so, you see, this God's glory is not a preening, grasping glory. The glory of Jesus is 
the radiance of the Father, one so superabounding in life and blessedness that He generates glory. Without any need or lack, His is the glory of the overflowing fountain of life. In polar contrast to our sinful understanding of grabbing glory. In Christ crucified, we see a divine glory that shines into our darkness, that confers life and goodness, that gives righteousness to helpless, unworthy sinners. As Martin Luther put it, Rather than seeking its own good, the love of God flows forth and bestows good. And therefore, how relevant, he could have written this this year, therefore, sinners are attractive because they are loved. They are not loved because they are attractive. Thus Christ says, I came to call not the righteous but sinners. He carries on. This is the love of the cross, which turns in the direction where it does not find good that it may enjoy, but where it may confer good upon the bad and the needy. Here in God is a glory infinitely more lovely than the needy, grasping glory of idols and sinners. Never would we have dreamed that God would be so beautifully different to us. But it is only in the face of Christ, in the hour of His glory, that we begin to understand the goodness of divine glory. The glory of God starts becoming beautiful good news to us. And so Jesus said, John 8, 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will know that I am. You will know what God is like when you see Him lifted up. Only then, in the beautiful face of Christ, will we begin to love God the glory of God more than the glory of men. The English reformer Thomas Cranmer, who was burned on that same spot after Ridley and Latimer a few months later, he wrote, the doctrine of salvation by Christ alone advances and sets forth the true glory of Christ and beats down the vain glory of man. Because in the face of Christ, especially Christ crucified, we see the depth of our sin and the height of His mercy. And so we see we have nothing to glory in in ourselves. We see we contribute nothing to our standing before God. We're not impressive. And so we simply cannot boast in ourselves or haughtily compare ourselves with others. And if we do boast in ourselves, it just betrays our blindness to the reality revealed in the cross. Because why would Christ have died if we could glory in ourselves? But in the face of Christ crucified, we see the glory of God's mercy and righteousness. In the glory of Christ the Savior, we see captivating great-heartedness. There, friends, is the only glory that can transcend the siren song of human glory. 
difference. It is the sight of the holy graciousness of God shown in Christ that is what has always given the saints the strength to stand firm. It is this sight that has surpassed the appeal of human approval and turned lambs into lions. This is not some natural courage that some stout-hearted folk are born with. It's not some natural inner strength some believers happen to have. So, John Calvin, Charles Spurgeon, they both confess their natural inclination to be timid and fearful. That's how they were born. But as they grew in their appreciation of God, they became lions in the cause of the gospel and God's word. So this is not a strength for the few. Here, friends, is a strength available for all the saints, timid saints, fearful saints, anxious saints, people pleasers. Here's the strength you need that will heal you and transform you, found in growing to enjoy the glory of Christ. And take one of the most famous examples of Christian stout-heartedness. Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms in 1521. What bravery! There, standing before the emperor, with all the power of Europe and the Roman Catholic Church marshaled against him, refusing to give up what Scripture plainly taught, Luther cried, I am bound by the Scriptures I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot, I will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. Now, you hear that and you think, what was the fire in his bones that enabled him to do that, pushing him to what he knew was a death sentence? And he says that. What, what was in him? Well, just a few moments before he spoke those famous words, he'd explain to the emperor exactly what drove him. Here it is. He said, We ought to think how marvelous and terrible is our God, lest we begin condemning the Word of God. It is knowing the marvelousness of God that stops us from betraying the Word of God. Or well, let me take you back to Hugh Latimer, the preacher we saw earlier dying in Oxford in the flames with such bold cheer. Now, a few years before that, Latimer explained what strengthened him, what gave him courage. Latimer, he was due to preach before King Henry VIII, who that fearsome king of many wives, many mistresses, of hot temper and zero tolerance. And Latimer decided to preach on the text, whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. <laughs> and before the king, he held back nothing. He spoke plainly what God's word says concerning the guilts of lust. When he was done, the king said, next time you are to preach, which was to be the next Sunday, you will apologize and eat your own words. Latimer thanked the king and left. And the next Sunday came, 
and he got into the pulpit and he said, Hugh Latimer, thou art this day to preach before the high and mighty Prince Henry, King of Great Britain and France. If thou sayest one single word that displeases his majesty, he will take thy head off. Therefore, mind what thou art at. But then he said, Hugh Latimer, thou art this day to preach before the Lord God Almighty, who is able to cast both body and soul into hell. And so tell the king the truth outright. And he did. And the king respected him for it. He loved the glory of God more than the glory of men. Fear him, ye saints, and ye will have nothing else to fear. The glory of God in the face of Christ has always been the lodestar and guiding light of reformation and faithfulness in the church. When Christians have appreciated God as all-sufficient, all-beautiful, all-satisfying, they've been strengthened and made fruitful. Even the timid ones. And for them, the world is not enough. Its glory and acclaim pale beside the splendor and the allure of Jesus Christ. May I finish with an insight from Song of Songs? Song of Songs is a book with two main characters, the lover and the beloved. The bridegroom and the bride. The lover, the bridegroom, is a shepherd king, the son of David. He stands at the door and knocks in chapter 5. His carriage in chapter 3 looks like the temple. And like the Lord in the Exodus, he comes up from the wilderness like a column of smoke. That's what the bridegroom is like. He's perfumed with the scents of the temple. And the bride, the beloved, is described as being like Israel, coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her lover, like Israel in the Exodus. She's compared to a vineyard, like Israel. She's compared to Jerusalem. And here's the verses I want you to see. Song of Songs, chapter 6, verses 4 and 10. He says to her, You are beautiful as tears, oh my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Verse 10, Who is this who looks down like the dawn? Beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. The bride is like an army. She's bright like the sun, with the reflected beauty of the moon. From the shy, embarrassed girl you meet at the beginning of the book, she has become awesome. And so it is with the bride of Christ. As Moses' face reflected the glory of the Lord, so the church comes to reflect the bridegroom's radiance and awesomeness. We know from the Apostle Paul that believers are being transformed into the image of God from one degree of glory to another, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But here we see 
the bride's transformation is a growth in reflected awesomeness, like the bridegroom. The church becomes awesome as an army with banners. When God's people, the church, love Christ and look to Him, they change from being weak, frightened, vacillating. They begin to exhibit to the world fearsome divine qualities, reflecting the glory of the Lord. They become holy, blessed, happy, whole, beautiful in Christ-likeness. And so the church shines like the moon in the world, in the darkness. Adoring Him, believers become like their God, blessedly, beautifully, fearsome. Dear friends, press in to know Christ better. Press in to enjoy the holy beauty of His glory so that you love the glory of God more than the glory of men. For if we love the glory of God more than the glory of men, then however testing the days to come may be, we will shine with valiant faith, awesome as an army with banners. Then we will be of good cheer like Latimer and Luther as we face down opposition and temptations to abandon God's word. And then, friends, the days of hard testing will, in the pages of church history, shine as among the brightest days of glory. And so now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the glory of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.